Okay, everybody, Stephen Key here, and today I have a very, very special guest, Lewis Foreman. Thank you very much for coming on InventRight TV. Well, it's great to be with you, Stephen, this evening. Um, you know what's amazing? We've known each other for, I think, a decade now. Is that right? Uh, I think it's actually more than a decade. It's probably going on 12 or 13 years. All right, so it's been a long time. And before we, I want everybody to know this topic, just so you you're going to get ready. We're going to talk about crowdfunding because that's exciting. That's a great um, opportunity for people to have ideas and maybe they need a little help. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about you. And I want to talk about all the things you have done because I went, I looked you up on the internet. I've known you for over a decade, but I was blown away too. The, the, the vastness of your knowledge, and that's why people are going to really love what you have to offer. It's pretty overwhelming. But it all started in your dorm room in college? Yeah, actually my uh, fraternity room in college. Uh, that's where I started my first business over 30 years ago. And that's how it all started because you were studying economics. Is that correct? That's what I saw too. That's right. All right. So you got the bug to be an entrepreneur in college. So that's where it all started. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if I got the bug or I just assumed that everybody already had the bug. Right. Uh, I played lacrosse at the University of Illinois. We didn't have a local supplier of equipment. This was the mid 1980s, so there was no internet. You couldn't just go online and order everything that you needed. And I was taking an Econ 101 class that semester and my professor explained to me the relationship between supply and demand. And what he explained was that when there is demand for a product or a service, and when the market doesn't satisfy that demand, there should be a business opportunity. So rather than just sit in class and take notes, I thought, you know, why not start a business? And you've been doing that ever since, haven't you? Yeah, you know, I've never been employed. I've always <laughs> created jobs, created opportunities, and uh, started businesses. Okay, so I'm looking at my notes here. It looks like you've done 12 startups but you've created other businesses. In fact, over 20, is that correct? Yeah, at least. I mean, I've kind of lost count because I've worked with and advised so many young entrepreneurs to start their business or seasoned executives who decide that they want to drop out from corporate America and start their own company. And so it, it's gratifying to know that if you can help them along the journey, help make it a little bit easier, uh, there's a much greater chance they'll be successful. Okay, wonderful. I want everybody that's listening, what's really amazing, I wrote this new book, Become a Professional Inventor, and I interviewed you for that book, and you're all over the book. I haven't sent you a copy yet. I have to do that. I'm sorry. Be because your advice, um, 30 years, is really solid, and, and that's what I really appreciate. But we met, I think, at the very beginning when you were launching a new platform. What was it called? Yeah, actually, we met at the casting calls for the TV show Everyday Edisons. Okay. Uh, back in 2007, we had this crazy idea that the inventing space needed okay. a reality TV show because there was no Shark Tank yet. All right. And so we traveled the country uh, listening to amazing ideas from inventors around the, around the country, around the world. We actually had inventors fly into the United States to our casting calls and uh, that was a lot of fun. It was uh, it was great to see those inventors firsthand. Now, that TV show went and it won awards. You won an Emmy, correct, for that? We actually won two Emmys. Uh, we did four seasons of the show, 52 episodes, between 2007 and 2012, uh, and won a couple Emmys for it and a couple Telly Awards as well. But more importantly, what we were able to do is make people's dreams come true. And that was the most gratifying part of it because – you had these inventors that just had a hope and a dream uh, and maybe a sketch on a napkin. Oh. And we transformed those ideas into products that ultimately went to the market and sold. Okay. Now, the, the behind the scenes, because I was watching that show, but you had this um, studio or this, what do you call it? Because that's part of your company now, right? Uh, where you build prototypes for people, correct? Yeah, 19 years ago, I started a company called Inventus, which is a product design firm. And I really started the company because I was frustrated as an inventor that the resources that I needed to bring my idea to market 
were all outside service providers. You'd mm -hmm. hire a design firm, a marketing firm, a branding agency, a package designer, a web developer, a videographer. And if the product was successful, everyone took credit, but if it failed, everyone blamed somebody else. Okay. And so my thought was, why not bring all those resources under one roof mm -hmm. and be held accountable for the success or failure of those products? Okay. Now, also, I mean, there's so many things to talk about. We'll get we'll get to crowdfunding. You know, everybody wants to hear it, but sure. I want to go through. You also set uh, set up a company called Edison Nation, uh, which is still in business today. And talk a little bit about that because we're going to show all these things we're talking about. We're going to show up on the screen a little bit later, but talk about that too. Sure. Well, what we learned at Inventus is you. Know, not every inventor is an entrepreneur, meaning there are inventors who have great ideas, but they don't want to assume risk. They don't want to start a company. They don't want to assume the financial risk of bringing that product to market. But if they can license that idea to somebody and collect a royalty without assuming you know, the expenses of starting a business, that's a great idea. Okay. And so back uh, in 2008, we said, let's take this inventor community that we've cultivated through the TV show and create an online marketplace where ideas can flow. And that was the beginning of Edison Nation and it's you know grown ever since. Now, what's really amazing about that, and we talked about this before, is the community you have over there. Uh, everybody seems to support one another they're there watching the whole process. How did you create that community? Because they're, they're really like-minded individuals. And how do they all come together? And how did you do that? Yeah, I like to believe that the community already existed. We just gave them a place to congregate. Okay. What we experienced at our casting calls for the TV show is that people immediately gravitated towards each other to share their successes and their okay. failures, to swap tips or contacts and you know back in 2008 you know the internet was just starting to kind of percolate with all these social networks and we thought why not create a social network for inventors because they needed a place where they felt at home where they felt comfortable where they weren't going to be exploited by companies trying to sell them services and most importantly a place where they can kind of you know succeed and celebrate success okay. It was a safe place, wasn't it? Yeah, Still it is. really I, was. I, I mean, we wanted it an area where, where okay. outside companies wouldn't go after these inventors and try selling them services. Okay. Um, let's talk about um, Inventors Digest. Now, that, that magazine has been around for a long time. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, yeah. we're celebrating our 35th year uh, anniversary of Inventors Digest magazine. And I wish I could say that, you know, uh, I was there from the very beginning, but I wasn't. We we took over the magazine. We bought the magazine back in 2007 uh, okay. from the publisher, Joanne Rines. Um, it was a labor of love for her. It's a labor of love for us as well. Uh, you know, the magazine industry is a tough industry to be in. Uh, it's not profitable. Uh, it's our biggest philanthropy every year that we contribute to. But we really believed that the inventor community needed a trusted resource of information. And so for 35 years, this magazine continues to be published and you can read it all for free online. So if you want a copy of the magazine mailed to your house, you can buy a subscription or you can read every single issue of the magazine online for free at inventorsdigest.com. That's awesome. Okay, the last thing, the USPTO. I know you're a patent holder. You help other inventors, but you've got a big footprint over at the USPTO. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the USPTO is, is one of the greatest government agencies because they're the catalyst of innovation. You know, the ability to prevent others from making, using, or selling what you've created for a period of 20 years from filing oh. is an amazing incentive to go out there and start a business or launch a product or try to license your invention. And so I was very fortunate uh, and honored to serve seven years on the U.S. Patent Office uh, Patent Public Advisory Committee, where the last couple of years I was chairman. And that gave me an inside look at what was really happening. And, and you know what? We, we were involved with AIA. Um, we were involved with some of the fee-setting rules. 
Um, it was just an amazing experience, and you really learn firsthand just how giving that organization is to the independent inventor community. They love to see inventors succeed. Oh, wonderful. Wow. Okay. Now let's get into the interview. All right. Oh, we're not done? Well, I, I, I could go on. I know I've got this list. I was like, you got to be kidding me. It would be the whole show on what you've done. But, Lewis, thank you for for being that bright light in this industry because it really needs a voice. It needs someone to lead, and you've been leading for a long time. So thank you very well, much I can, for doing I can that. say the same about you, Stephen. So, the, you know, the, the industry needs individuals to step up and pay it forward. I and, so. you know, this is, this is an industry where – you know, the, the rising tide rises, you know, all ships. You know, it's not about one person succeeding. It's about a whole group of inventors succeeding. And so, you know, we need to celebrate the successes and we also need to learn from the mistakes. Sure. Now, you're helping inventors in a different way now. Let's talk about, let's talk about the crowdfunding opportunity because you've been, in, now you're in that space. You're helping a lot of people raise those very important dollars at the very beginning. What's happening over there? And I know it's some things that probably have changed in the last couple of years. What's currently going on? Yeah, so we've done over 2,000 Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns uh, in the last number of years. And what has changed is that the process of bringing a product to market has fundamentally shifted. When I got into this business 19 years ago, and even you know, back when you, you know, started with your products, the path to market was assume a tremendous amount of risk, make the product, sell it to physical brick and mortar retailers, and then cross your fingers. Because if that product didn't sell through, it was coming back, or they were asking for markdown dollars. And so the advent of e-commerce changed that whole power balance because now all of a sudden an entrepreneur or an inventor could sell direct to a consumer or through an online resource and they could you know bypass the traditional brick and mortar retailers until the product had enough traction to justify assuming the risk of shipping to big retailers so what crowdfunding has done is it initially was a way for entrepreneurs to bootstrap their idea you throw an idea online People back it financially. If you get enough backing, it's an indication that there's interest. And now you've got undiluted capital that you can use to launch your business. But we look at crowdfunding as a way to validate consumer demand. So it's a way to test an idea before you make the commitment of manufacturing the product, creating inventory, and assuming a tremendous amount of risk of launching the product. So typically the process now is come up with a great idea, build a prototype, do a Kickstarter campaign, see how the market reacts, see if the idea resonates with consumers. If it does, All right. then move forward, make the product, fulfill your orders, and go to either license the idea or be an entrepreneur. And if it doesn't, cut your losses, figure out what went wrong, and All then right. try it again. Wow, okay, so I'm an inventor, I've got this great idea. I'm going to test it. Um, let's talk a little bit about that campaign to get the word out because it's it's been around now for a little while. I'm sure it's changed. I'm sure it's a little little bit. There's probably more competition. What does it take today to to build that audience so they can find you? Yeah, it, it definitely has changed. In the early days of Kickstarter, back when the coolest cooler raised over 26 million dollars, there were so few campaigns and so much interest that every campaign did quite well. Today, there's obviously a lot more noise, so you gotta figure out how do you rise above all the other campaigns and get people to hear your message. And the reality is, the secret sauce, it's not secret, is you gotta market. You've gotta spend money on social media right. to drive traffic to that, that campaign. And so as a general rule of thumb, you should be spending somewhere between 15 and 25 cents of every dollar you hope to generate. So if you're hoping to generate $100,000 for your campaign, you're probably gonna spend 15 to $25,000 to drive that okay. $100,000. But assuming you have normal margins in your product, it will still be a successful campaign. Okay, so it takes some time, it takes some money. How early should you start? 
I mean, as early you... as you can, right? So before you even launch the campaign on Kickstarter, you want to spend at least four to six weeks building a backer list, oh. meaning going out there, doing a little bit of publicity and PR, building a, a list of people who will back the product once it goes live. Because the goal okay. with a Kickstarter campaign is as soon as you go live, you want it to fully fund within the first few hours or the first day. That creates the fear of missing out. That gets people excited uh, that this campaign okay. is actually going to deliver. And then hopefully it goes viral at that point. Okay, wow. But I don't have that many friends. I don't have that many backers. What do I do? Yeah, so that, that's where you hire an agency. Um, you know, we're the largest agency out there for crowdfunding campaigns. As I mentioned, we've done over 2,000 of them. We've raised in excess of $300 million for our clients. And we've got a backer list of over 12 million backers who have backed campaigns that we've already done before. So we've got this head start, right? We've already got a mm -hmm. list of people who understand what crowdfunding is. They're comfortable with the way we do these campaigns uh, and it just it just starts the process. Well, that's a that's a big benefit, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I think so. I, you know, I think it's a it's a huge benefit. But right. but understand that we can't help everyone. Not every campaign's okay. a good fit for us. Uh, some campaigns probably need to be much smaller with smaller expectations because not every type of product does well on Kickstarter. For example, baby products typically don't do well because. By the time you deliver, the baby may not be a baby anymore. Good point. Um, what about prototypes? I've got this rough sketch on a napkin. I think it's going to work. Maybe it doesn't work. What do I do? Yeah, you need to you need to turn your rough concept into something that looks like and works like the actual product, especially if you're going to do a crowdfunding campaign. In the early years of Kickstarter, you could just throw a rendering on the screen, and that was enough. But Kickstarter, you know, because there were so many fraudulent campaigns where the product never got made, right. they now require you to have a working prototype of the product. So you're further along in the process. So you, and you help you're part of one of your companies helps with that, too, if you need that. Is that correct? We okay. can. You know, the, the whole concept be, behind Inventus when I started the business 19 years ago was to bring all the resources under one roof so mm -hmm. we can be a one stop shop doesn't mean people have to use us for everything. People may just use us for a crowdfunding campaign, or they may just use us for industrial design or building a prototype. But because we have those resources, we're able to help people along the journey. You know, one of the, the overlooked resources for prototyping is your local university or community college. You know, there are incredible resources at those those institutions okay. and students who need ex you know practice and experience. Um, so there, if there's a will, there's a way. You'll find find okay. the resources you need to to get that prototype. That prototype doesn't need to be perfect, does it, Lewis? Can it be? Uh, looks pretty good. It only has to work one time, right? To get it on some type of video, is that right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, you know, remember a prototype is a process. Uh, James Dyson had five thousand one hundred and twenty-seven prototypes before he was satisfied with his vacuum cleaner. So a prototype isn't press a button, it pops out. Hey, I'm ready. Every time you produce a prototype, you're learning something about your product. You're learning how it functions, how consumers react to it, how they interact to it or okay. with it. And you're going to figure out whether or not you can improve upon that product through iterative prototyping. Okay. You had mentioned to me earlier, you don't take everybody. You're very no, picky. No, uh, as much as I'd love to, um, we're just not a fit for everybody because okay. sometimes we don't have the right internal resources. Um, in some cases, the client's just not ready for prime time, or maybe they don't have the budget for it, or mm. we just don't feel like it's a big enough industry to justify the investment. Hmm. So you're really giving them good advice. You might say, hey, look, this, given everything we know, maybe you should do something else. Is that what you're saying too? Well, we're always honest with the customer. Right. Um, you know, we don't charge anything to look at the idea or to talk with a customer. Uh, in many cases, it's just not a good fit and for a variety of reasons. But we always point them in the direction of other resources that might make sense. And it may be working with some college students or maybe, you know, 
doing more research or education on how to license the idea through your program, or it may just be, you know what, research the market, talk to some customers, and figure out whether or not there's a big enough problem that you're trying to solve. Because right. inventors quite often, you know, invent the $100 aspirin, right? You know, they've got a headache right. and they create this great remedy, but the cost of the solution is more than the problem that they're solving. And so what you don't want to do is create something where there's a limited market or where the cost of the, the remedy, you know, is more than what the problem that it's actually solving. Is there any way to test that before you go down that road of crowdfunding a little bit? Do you show it to a friend's family? And of course, they're going to say they love it. Is there anything else you recommend? Yeah, you know, obviously you want to do market research. Right. And so inventors are notoriously afraid to share their idea, and rightfully so. But you don't have to necessarily explain your product. What you need to do is address the problem and how that customer currently addresses it or solves that problem. What do they like about the current solution? What don't they like about it? Would they be willing to try something different? And how much they'd be willing to pay for something that works better? Because if they find out that customers are fiercely loyal to what they're currently buying and not willing to try something different, it's gonna be an uphill battle. On the flip side, you may find that customers are absolutely dissatisfied with everything that's currently available and they're willing to spend a lot of money for a better right. solution. So how would you do that? I mean, would you do a focus group in your town? Would you go to a meetup? I mean, how would you do that so you don't have the exposure? Yeah, so all of the above. So let's just, let's just pretend for a minute that I've come up with a great way to groom a dog. So I've, I've come up with a product that grooms a dog better than what I believe other products do. So obviously my customer has to be a dog owner. Talking with anyone that doesn't have a dog is a waste of time. And so where would you find dog owners? Well, they're walking into PetSmart or they're in a park with their owner. And so you go up to those individuals and just, you know, explain to them that you're an inventor, you're an entrepreneur, you know their time is valuable. Maybe give them a 5 or $10 gift card to a, you know, a local retailer if they would just be honest with them. And you could just ask them a couple of questions. You can say, how do you currently groom your dog? All right. What do you like about that product? What don't you like about it? If there was a better product available, would you try it? Hmm. Okay. How much would you be willing to pay for it? And where would you expect to buy it? Okay. And so in six simple questions, I haven't shared my idea. I haven't given away any of my intellectual property. But what I've figured out is how viable is okay. this market opportunity? Good. Great advice. Last question. Uh, everybody's watching crowdfunding. The good guys, the bad guys, maybe the companies that want to license your ideas, maybe the people over in some other country, they're all watching successful campaigns. Yeah. How do you navigate that world? Yeah, you know, uh, they say that uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, uh, unless you're the entrepreneur or the inventor who came up with the product to begin with. Yeah. The, the problem is, is that bad actors are going to behave badly okay. regardless of what you do, whether you launch it on a Kickstarter campaign or you sell your product on Amazon or it ends up on a store shelf at Walmart, people who want to copy you are going to. Right. And so, you know, patents keep honest companies honest, but it's not going to prevent people from knocking you off. I mean, we've had over the years so many of our products that we've launched and the next thing you know, they're showing up, you know, on Alibaba or they're showing up on eBay. And it's frustrating. You know, okay. it, it's just infuriating that these companies didn't have to invest the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop the product. All they had to do is just copy the product exactly. But there is an advantage to being the first mover. There's an advantage to you know, getting your product out there, establishing a strong brand, you know, that is much easier to protect through a trademark. And then, you know, in many cases, Inventors will file a design patent around their product to prevent someone from exactly copying the product because the ornamental appearance of the product can also be protected, not just the function. Yeah, they seem like when they copy, they copy everything. So you should probably trademark it. That's going to probably take about six months. Design patents, 
copyright, all those type. Those are simple tools too. To yeah, even even copyrights on on the you know the pictures on your packaging. I mean, we we've had products where not only did they copy the product, but they literally used all of our pictures, including the children pictures of children of our employees on one of the packages. Put that on their package. Okay. All right. Well, that's good advice, but be prepared. So crowdfunding, uh, Lewis, thank you very much for sharing that. I know there's a lot of people out there that want to try it, but it is a big investment. It's going to take some time. You need to be prepared. Do your homework. Test it and see if, if there's a possibility that maybe people don't want it. Do a little homework yourself. But be prepared to spend some time and energy and money. And if you're ready, go for it. Is that it? That's all right. Yeah. You know, it's... it. it Entrepreneurship and being an inventor is about balancing risk and reward. And sometimes there's just not enough juice for the squeeze. So you've got to look at a situation and realize that there is going to be risk associated okay. with it. Risk, of course, being that it could fail, you could lose a lot of money, but there's got to be enough reward to justify why you're taking on that risk. And the best advice I can you know, give is surround yourself with good, honest people who have done it before because it makes the journey so much more enjoyable, it's less lonely, and the likelihood of success is significantly greater. Far greater. Well, Lewis, thank you very much. Everybody, if you're interested in more information, we're going to have it down below. You can reach out to Lewis. Check it out. If you've got a great idea that's wonderful for crowdfunding, make sure to contact Lewis. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure, Stephen. Good being with you tonight. Thank you.